We are in the gardens of the Palace of Nations in Geneva, where the United Nations Human Rights Council and the Human Rights Committees meet. It is in this famous place that we will address the next three theoretical issues on the relationship between human rights and IHL. We will start by considering four potential legal obstacles to the application of human rights to an armed conflict. A first one would come from IHL itself. Do some provisions of that law exclude the concurrent application of human rights law? The answer is no. To the contrary, IHL implicitly considers such application. Article 75, paragraph 8 of Additional Protocol 1 indicates that the essential guarantees that it provides to some persons may not, and I quote, be construed as limiting or infringing any other favorable provisions granting greater protection under any applicable rules of international law. Any applicable rules of international law implicitly refers to human rights law. A second potential legal obstacle is the argument that human rights treaties cease to apply during times of war. War would act as a ground for termination of human rights treaties. To answer this question, we must look at the draft articles on the effects of armed conflicts on treaties. A codification of customary international law recently prepared by the International Law Commission. If we look at Article 7 of the draft and Paragraph F of the Annex to the draft, we can see that treaties for the international protection of human rights continue in operation during armed conflict. A third obstacle may be linked to the fact that human rights treaty contain a measure of flexibility to enable the level of protection to be adjusted, as circumstances require. One of the main ways in which human rights conventions provide flexibility is through the use of derogation clauses. Derogation clauses enable the suspension of some obligations during times of crisis. Most of the general human rights treaties, including the two inter international covenants of 1966 and the European Convention on Human Rights and the American Convention on Human Rights, provide that the state parties can derogate from the rights protected in those treaties when the survival of the nation is at stake. Recently, states that have been the victims of terrorist attacks such as France and Turkey, have submitted derogations to the European Convention on Human Rights. It is clear that an armed conflict can be considered to be a situation for which derogation is permitted. However, in order for a derogation to be obtained, it must conform to strict conditions. More importantly, states are not allowed to derogate from fundamental human rights, such as the right to life and the prohibition on torture. As a result, those rights could never be derogated in times of armed conflict. The final problem concerned the geographical scope of application of human rights convention. This problem may arise in situations where an armed conflict extends beyond the territory of a state. In those circumstances, is that state obliged to respect human rights on the territory of another state? This is the famous issue of the extraterritorial application of human rights. While this has historically been a controversial question, it is now generally accepted that human rights conventions are binding extraterritorially. Some human rights instruments, such as the European Convention on Human Rights and the American Convention 
on human rights expressly provide that they apply to all persons under the jurisdiction of the state parties and not just on the territory of those states. What does that mean? According to the case bill of various international human rights bodies, human rights treaty is also applicable to persons outside the territory of a state when that state has an effective control over the area where the person is located. It is also admitted by some human rights bodies that a person is under the jurisdiction of a state and therefore enjoys the protection afforded by the relevant human rights law if he or she is under the phys physical power and control of agent of the state. Even if that state has no effective control over the area where the person is located. It is particularly relevant for the detention of individuals in contexts where the detaining states cannot be said to have control over the territory where the individual was captured. 